Professor Kane, normally at this juncture, I would be interviewing the incumbent Goodhart Professor as a follow-up to a first interview mm -hmm. and would concentrate on how the time during the tenure had transpired. Mm -hmm. In your case, we are faced with an interesting circumstance because the first interview was with Professor Stapleton. So here we are at the end of the academic year, but instead of just a backward glance, I hope we can spend a good deal of the interview looking at your early career as well as some reflections of your time here. You and Professor Stapleton constitute the fourth holder of the professorship, but you are the fifth incumbent to be interviewed. So briefly, could we look at your early career, how it developed, and then come to the good heart material, and perhaps a bit at the end, very broadly, some aspects of your personal research interests. You were born in Maitland, in New South Wales in 1950. Can you Great. have any recollections of a small town? Um, no, I don't because we left when I was two years old. Um, I was born, <laughs> curiously, in a flood. So th the, the best memory I have of my early life, apart from other photographs, is my mother handing me up to an ambulance man in an amphibious vehicle. <laughs> Which we call in the Australian Army Ducks, I think they're probably called that here as well, because our house was on high ground and the hospital one was on high ground, but everything in between was flooded. But since we left Maitland when I was two, I don't really have any, any recollections of being there. So did you move? We moved to Newcastle, which is on the coast about 30 miles from Maitland. It's about 30 miles in there from Newcastle, and Newcastle is about 100 miles north of Sydney. And that is where you went to school? Well, I went to primary school. We moved around a lot. Uh, I went to primary school in Newcastle, and then we moved to Sydney, and I went to primary school for one year in Sydney, and then I went to high school in Sydney, went to university in Sydney. Uh, so really became a sentient adult. <laughs> in Sydney rather than in Newcastle. In a small town. Um, yeah. w well, you, you went to Sydney uh, to read classics in graduating in 1971, and I wondered what your particular interest in classics yeah. was. Well, it's an interesting question. When I went to high school, I went to a state school, but it was a selective state school. And it was an unusual state school because it had a lot of classics that had a separate Latin and Greek department uh, and a Latin and Greek master and Latin and Greek teachers. I started out doing Latin and French and at the end of my first year at school, curiously the librarian, who was herself a maths teacher, <laughs> said to me, you should be doing Greek. So um, she was clearly very influential because I there and then made the decision that I'd do Greek and I... I studied the first year of Greek over the summer holidays and went into second year doing Greek and Latin. So I did Greek and Latin for the whole of my time at school. Then when I went to university, it just seemed an obvious thing to go on doing. So that's how I ended up doing classics. It was all a bit, it was all a bit happenstance, really, as many things in life are. And I wondered what made you switch to law. Well, I didn't switch law. I, I started because I, when I started at university, it was, the, I think, the first year of the introduction of combined degrees. So this, this was a, a combined degree course where you would do another degree course with law. And indeed, I think probably the majority of law students in Australia now do it this way. They, they do a combined arts law or science law or economics law degree which is effective, when I did it, it was six years, so it was effectively two years of arts and four years of law, but now it's two years of arts and three years of law for most people, so it's a five-year course. You end up with two degrees at the end of it, but you don't actually do two full degree courses. The, the first degree course is a bit truncated because you've got a, a, a law component, but you end up with two degrees. So that was why I did that, because it was. Um, I'd, I think I'd always wanted to do law. I had at one stage planned to do honours in classics, but then uh, I decided that, I can remember the time when I decided that wasn't really for me, so I, I gave up the plan of uh, continuing with classics and just went straight into the law. But I didn't change the law, I, I started out doing law right from the start. I see. And um, so you 
graduated in 1974 and I wondered whether there were any special mentors in the department at Sydney who mm. you recall. Um, <laughs> well, I, I, I worked as a research assistant for um, a professor of contract law called David Harland, and that was, that was quite uh, an important uh, opportunity for me because it was the first time that I'd really done any serious research, so he employed me after some holidays as a research assistant. It was relatively... Uh, that, that was an interesting job to do. It was relatively unusual, but... Um, so I guess he, he, I guess he didn't. He didn't really personally inspire me, but doing that job was important. Intellectually, I suppose, curiously, a guy called Bill Morrison, who was a professor of torts, although in later years I, I uh, fell out of love with his intellectual style. Certainly, when I was at law school, he uh, he was quite influential. Uh, Bob Austin, who is now. I know what he was a judge of the New South Wales Supreme Court. Uh, he was quite, I found him quite interesting. But I didn't really, I didn't really take off intellectually in law until I went to Oxford. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't actually think, my, my, my real intellectual influences were not in Sydney, they were in Oxford, I think. Right. Well, definitely not, I think, definitely. Did you practice at all? You qualified as a solicitor. Well, I did, yes, because when, when I did law, uh, there was no, there were no, there was no um, College of Law, Law Society's um, practical course. It was all done by an article system. And very many people did articles concurrently with the last two years of their degree, which was a pretty demanding schedule because we'd go to lectures in the morning and then go to work and go to a lecture at lunchtime and go to work and go to a lecture in the afternoon and then go to the library at night. So it, it was pretty, it was a pretty full-on experience. So I did articles for the last two years of my degree and then I, I, I worked off, I worked for the nine months before I went to Oxford, but I, was, I knew that I wasn't going to be a practitioner at that stage. So no, I hadn't, I hadn't ever practised in any series. What made you decide to come to, to Oxford in 1976? Um, well, <laughs> well, I think I, curiously, I'd always known that I wanted to be an academic, a very odd thing to say, but, uh, and so I knew I wanted to do graduate work. And I started searching around. I, I, once, I really wanted to come to England, partly, I suppose, because of the classical background, because um, I'd used all these classical texts that were edited by professor of Latin at Oxford and professor of Greek at Oxford. So um, it had that sort of mystique about it, I suppose. And for Australians, many Australians, then it was really, it was really, and still true that it's very important for Australians to get out of Australia, uh, academic Australians anyway, possible to get out of Australia and experience a different, a different system. It's good for everyone, I guess. Um, and... I looked at one stage if I might go to the University of Virginia because they offered me some money. But then, the last minute, I got a scholarship from Sydney University that I was able to use in Oxford. So, I came where you to stayed for twenty years, moving from a lectureship to a professorship. Well, yes, I, I was there as two, for two years as a graduate student. Then I went back to Australia for about eighteen months, and then I came back to Oxford in nineteen beginning of nineteen seventy eight, and then was there till nineteen ninety seven. Yeah. And I was a, the, the, the employment structure is rather different in Oxford from what it is in Cambridge. So I started out as a tutor in Corpus Christi College and a lecturer, at university lecturer. And then I think in 1996 I got a readership and then 1997 a professorship. And it seems to me that it was a very productive time in your life. The milieu must have suited you. Well, yes, as I, yes, as I said, as I said to you, um, Oxford was an intellectual awakening for me because it was an extremely exciting period in Oxford at that stage. Um, Dawkins had just taken over the chair of jurisprudence, and I was exposed to, I was exposed to ways of thinking and uh, that I'd never experienced before. So it was it it was intellectually extremely, um, extremely exciting. Yeah. Do you have recollections of Dawkin? Oh yes, yeah, lots of yeah, yes, lots of recollections of Dawkin. He was, he was a very powerful. He was a very powerful lecturer, uh, and um, 
the most articulate person I think I've ever, most articulate lecturer I think I've ever experienced. Later when I was an academic in Oxford, I can remember he ran a series of seminars with Bernard Williams, who's a very famous philosopher, and Amartya Sen, of course, who's a very famous economist. But in terms of, and of course, Williams and Sen were both very great intellects. And uh, but Dworkin, Dworkin had a facility in extempore argument, which was which uh, was superior even to the facility of both Williams and Sen. So I can read he, he was he was a very articulate is. A very articulate person. Mm. Very interesting. And could you, having now spent a year at Cambridge, are you in a position to draw some comparisons with the two in terms of the mm. sort of style or the mode of operation? Well, part of the problem is that I haven't been in Oxford for now almost 15 years. We left in 1997, so I'm a bit out of touch with, with Oxford. But I do think that... Um, there are there is there are important differences in the modus operandi. I think of the two uh, faculties. Cambridge, the structure of Cambridge is somewhat like the structure of Oxford was until they introduced the the office of dean to the law faculty in Oxford, and I think that's changed a lot of things. And it, it um, so coming to Cambridge is a bit like. Going to going to Oxford as it was before when I was there because that was pre the current system. There, there wasn't a dean when I was there, so Cambridge is in some ways reminiscent of what Oxford was like in the nineteen eighties and early nineteen nineties in terms of its general structure and and, and the uh, modus operandi of the faculty, as you put it. Right. Yes. I probably shouldn't go any further than that. <laughs> <laughs> but that yeah, so they're different. You returned to Australia in 1997, mm-hmm. and I wondered what drew you back. Mm-hmm. Well, it was a complex of things, really. I was, it was, to some extent, roots. But I wanted to go back to Australia. I'd lived in England for a long time, and um, I, 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 I'd never really. There, there are some Australians who become more English than the English. There are some patriot Australians who who really grow very deep roots into the soil, but I never did, I think. So that was part of the reason. Um, I, uh, I didn't feel particularly strongly connected with my college in Oxford, uh, which in the Oxbridge context is... Um, it's, it's a disadvantage because a lot of what Oxford and Cambridge are about are colleges. Uh, I had, I had um, in early years, felt strong connections with the college, but I, for various reasons, I, they became looser. But also I had a um, uh, Leverhulme Trust Research Fellowship uh, in 1996, I think. Which rather rather um, spoilt me for the life of full time research. And as it happened, we got a letter through the letterbox in the middle of that year. I think it was in must have been in May nineteen ninety six. Yes, May ninety six. I think um, alerting us to these jobs in Canberra, uh, which were pure research jobs. And the combination of all those. Actors really came together. Right. Mm. Throughout your career, you've had many sabbaticals, and I noticed that mm. you've gone to the States um, many times. Mm-hmm. Um, a frequent visitor to Texas at least mm-hmm. four times. You've mm-hmm. been to North Carolina, mm-hmm. Columbia. Um, what is of particular interest to you in US law or the US legal system? Yes, I mean, that's an interesting question. The reason I, the Colum- most of those, except for the North Carolina, which was a long time ago, it was about in the early 1980s, I think, when I was in Oxford. Apart from that, most of my connections with the US are indirectly through Jane because she's a member of the Texas law faculty. So the reason I go to Texas so much is because she goes to Texas. Um, so that, that was the initial catalyst for that. And she's 
a, uh, an expert on US law, whereas I'm not. But as a result of doing that, I have developed quite a lot of interest in comparative law using the US, the UK and Australia as, as jurisdictions to compare. Uh, so that, from that, that's now why um, going to the US is important for me, because I do, in public law, not in private law, but in public law, I do quite a lot of comparative work comparing those three yes. jurisdictions. So that's that. So, so going to the US was not something that I really initiated originally, but it's um, it's proved to be fruitful for me. Going That's to the US. interesting. Yeah. And you also have links with China. You went there yeah. in two thousand and eight, and at least three of your books have been translated. Yes, that's an amazing. Is that's amazing, isn't it? Who yes, is that? that is amazing. Well, I don't know. I have no idea. So yes, I went to. So this visit to China was originally scheduled for two thousand and four. There's a summer a philosophy summer school in China that's run by the Royal Society of Philosophy here, the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia, and an American. There's American. Uh, there's an American end of it as well. And it's been running, well, when we went in 2008, it was the 20th anniversary of this summer school. And it's, it's and it just so happened that they were doing a, 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 a year on legal philosophy, which was originally meant to be in 2004, but bird flu uh, caused the cancellation of it in 2004. It didn't actually happen until 2008. So I guess um, because, so the Australian, the Australian person involved in this, because it's, it's, it's a three-week summer school uh, involving graduate students and junior faculty from all around China. Uh, in, and there are about, I think there are four or five lecturers. And there's one from Australia, and the, the uh, Academy of Social Sciences in Australia nominates the Australian person, and I was approached to find out whether I, want, whether I was interested in going there. And I said, yes, I was. It, probably I was approached because I'd recently published a book on uh, law, um, on law and morality, on responsibility in law and morality. So I, I, I got interested in, I, my work had become quite theoretical when I went back to Australia, so I got interested in legal theory. So I think that's probably why I was, why I was approached. Um, the translation of the books into Chinese is a bit of a mystery to me, actually. The first one to be translated was Responsibility in Law and Morality, and the way that was translated was I simply got out of the blue one day an email from a woman in Beijing, who is actually, she was actually, uh, I think, Chief Legal Counsel for GE in China. But her father was a very distinguished academic at uh, University of Peking. And he'd, and he'd, he'd suggested to her, she must have had uh, translation experience or translation aspirations, I don't know. Anyway, her father had suggested to her that she should translate this book into Chinese. So she just emailed me and said, can I translate your book into Chinese? And I said, yes, why not? Um, so she did, uh, at the same time as being pregnant, so she delivered a translation of the child at the same time, which was interesting. So that was the first one. Uh, then uh, it's just been ha happenstantial after that, I think. Oh, Accidents, Compensation of Law had already been translated into Chinese, I think. Or was that? Yes, that, that was the first one to be done, I think. Accidents, Compensation of Law was the first one to be done. And I didn't have anything to do with that. That was just done through CUP. Um, the Anatomy of Tort Law was also translated into Chinese. That was done through, I think, the publisher approached hard publishing here, so I didn't have much to do with that either. But actually, the, uh, the Oxford, New Oxford Companion to Law is also being translated into Chinese really? at the moment. But of course, I didn't contribute very much to that. I co-edited it, but I didn't contribute very much to it. And that is a really big project, and I think that's being done by Peking University Press, I think. Anyway, but, but I can't explain it. I wondered about that. <laughs> I can't explain it. <clears throat> um, that brings us to your good heart tenure, a joint, this is the first joint tenure. And I wondered how it had been, has it been a good year for research and teaching? Did you, what did you hope to work on and achieve research-wise? Well... Yes, I mean, I really brought with me a lot of projects that needed to be finished off. So I haven't been doing one major project since I've been here. I've done a couple of new editions of Australian student books. Uh, and um, I've written a couple of 
papers. So that's the main, they're the main things that I've done since I've been here. And um, yeah, I've got, I've got enough done. You can always do a lot. It's, how long is a piece of string? You can yes. always do more. I've got a major project that I had hoped to get underway this year but haven't. But we'll have to do when I get back to Australia. But um, it was probably unrealistic to expect to be able to do that. Yeah, so. And uh, the, from our point of view, the good half has been marvellous because we haven't been expected to do a lot, so we've had plenty of time just to do our own work, which is, suits me. And I've done a bit of teaching, which has been very interesting, and a bit of supervision of undergraduate dissertations, but, but um, mainly just, just been left to get on with our own work. But we did, Jane and I did put on, a, in, in um, the Easter term, we did put on a series of seminars, good yes. art seminars, uh, in which uh, younger members of the faculty predominantly gave papers. And this, I think, has, was, was an innovation, and it's an innovation, I think, that will stick. Yes. So I think in terms of uh, our lasting impact on Cambridge, one would hope that that will be, that will be the lasting impact that we've made, that is to, to yes. encourage, uh, to encourage uh, more seminar-giving in private law? Uh, well, not necessarily. It was private and public law. It doesn't really matter what area it's in. It can be in any area. It was just that to, to establish, to start, a, to start a pattern of having a regular annual seminar series that gives members of the faculty an opportunity to present their work. It certainly will leave a lasting legacy. One hopes so, yes. I mean, yes. how long it will go on or not, um, one doesn't know. But um, I think that's probably the most... The most um, high-profile thing that we've done since we've been here yes. for the faculty. Yeah. Um, what would be your abiding memories of the year that you've spent here? <laughs> Anything? Well, you're, you're going to find this funny. Our our house, because the Goodhart professorship comes with this huge house in Trumpington Road, which has the most splendid garden. So that's. You would, one would, having lived in Goodhart Lodge, you would never forget having lived in Goodhart Lodge. Uh, uh, so that's that's a memory. Um, being involved with the colleges, um, going to lots of college feasts, which are a particularly Cambridge institution. I think the college feast is a very Cambridge institution that doesn't exist in quite the same form in Oxford. Really? Uh, so that's 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 and James had a connection with St John's, and we've had a lot to do with St John's, and that's on it. But that's been a marvelous experience as well. Um, so I'm not I'm not really telling you work things, and we've done we've done some marvelous travel as well. So we've been to Istanbul, and we've been to Sicily, and we've been to France, and we've been to Spain. Wonderful. So we've done some travel as well. So we certainly will never forget the year, uh, and being involved, being able to spend more time with with colleagues, and uh, being able to observe the faculty has been very very interesting, and to understand more about how Cambridge works and what it's strengths and weaknesses are as a, as a law faculty. It's all, been, it's all been very interesting. Any um, long-term, perhaps, collaborations that might ensue as a result of this? <laughs> I'm not thinking of the long-term, because I'm only five years from retirement, so I don't no. know what you mean by long-term. <laughs> but um, no, no, I haven't... Don't, don't, no, I, haven't, no I, I have not developed any, any plans for long-term collaboration with with um, colleagues here. I, I knew a lot of colleagues before I came here and, and um, deepening those relationships has been, has been very good. But there's no, no, no concrete collaborations that come into it. No. Can we briefly pick up one or two points in your extensive research output and interests? You have a very illustrious and extensive publication list. And of course, I cannot begin to attempt to cover even a summary but I have had a chance, I'm very pleased to say, and benefited greatly from looking at some of your books and papers mm -hmm. and picked out a few points. Uh, first of all, I selected your Taught Law of, of Australia because it was your first textbook yes. in its fifth edition now. Mm -hmm. And I wondered what drew you to this area originally because several of my previous interviewees have also started mm -hmm. out with Taught, uh, Mr. Dias. Uh, mm -hmm. Professors Jolovitz and Heppel, mm -hmm. and then they moved on to other topics. And I wondered right. why. Why did I start in tort law? 
Well, Bill Morrison, whom I mentioned earlier, uh, as one of the one of the people at Sydney, was taught me torts, and uh, at the time when he was teaching me torts, I found his teaching very stimulating. Um, I then got involved in the Sydney Law Review and uh, was allocated uh, a tort case, Dutton and Bogner Regis, a very famous tort case from the early 70s, to write a case note on for this issue of the Sydney Law Review. So that was actually my first publication. So that was what really got me started in torts, I guess. Um, and I just went on from there, I think. Um, and I found the subject interesting and attractive. And so, um, and I think I, I always found it more interesting than contracts uh, in, the, in the private law area. And I think, yes, and, and I think to some extent too, you tend to be influenced by your teaching, probably. So I think the fact that I found the teaching in talks quite stimulating probably helped. I also enjoyed looking at your book, uh, which I selected because this is the book on administrative tribunals. Yes. When you return to Australia, yes. very unusual, neglected topic, yes. breaking new ground. And here again, there was a link for me because a previous interviewee, Professor Heppel, yes. was at one stage heavily involved in UK industrial tribunals, yes. in yes. contrast to your mm. administrative mm. But he eventually moved out because he found that he, he found them intellectually frustrating yeah. because they were too fact driven. Yes. And I wondered whether you think that this is a feature of all tribunal work that or whether in fact it is a topic that legal theorists and academics mm -hmm. can really get their teeth into. Um, or is it too factual? Well, I think there are two different questions there actually. One is yes, the the work of most tribunals is very fact-oriented because the main function of tribunals is to resolve appeals essentially on issues of fact from decisions by administrative Leaving aside employment tribunals, leaving aside industrial tribunals, administrative tribunals, their main function is fact-finding. It's only probably when, now when you get up into the higher reaches of the tribunal system, the upper tribunal as it's now called, where, where there will be a, a, a greater legal content in what they're doing, but certainly at the at the uh, initial level, then it's very fact-driven. It doesn't follow from that, though, that tribunals are not intellectually or academically interesting as phenomena. So I'm not sure what Bob Heppel's, whether he meant that he, he stopped studying tribunals or whether he meant he stopped, I don't know whether he did tribunal work, but I, but I think, um, I, I think the fact that tribunals have been so little studied uh, by public lawyers reflects perhaps that sort of judgment, that is, that there's nothing t terrifically interesting from a constitutional point of view about tribunals. But actually, they are extremely interesting from a, from a constitutional point of view, from a legal point of view, from a political point of view, from an institutional point of view, they're, and they're extremely important. So, uh, yes, they are, they are predominantly fact finding bodies, but they play an extremely important part in the constitutional setup, and that's why I got interested in them. In fact, why I got interested in them, as I think I say in the book, is because uh, of the particular institutional structure of the tribunal system in Australia. Uh, and, uh, and because of that particular institutional structure, tribunals are constitutionally very interesting in Australia, but People tend not to think of them as constitutionally interesting, or used not to think of them as constitutionally interesting in England, but they are actually, once you start thinking about it, and the contrasts and comparisons between the three jurisdictions are very, are very interesting. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, you have edited several OUP compilations, okay. and one that I selected was the New Oxford companion, oh. and that is because I all the reviews that I've read of your scholarly books oh. have been highly commending and praising, mm -hmm. and I found one exception, and that was by someone at Glasgow, mm. Ross Gilbert Anderson, who criticised the change in emphasis in the new Oxford companion, oh. and I wondered whether you think he was justified in criticising your deviation from the original 1980 Walker 
edition. So what did he concept. say? Do you think? I briefly, I pushed along. He said I have seen through it. It's very, very interesting too. <laughs> he said that it, the, the new companion has moved away from detail to themes. <clears throat> the content is more broad brush. Mm -hmm. He felt that where Scott's law was perhaps overrepresented in the original companion, mm -hmm. it has been relegated. Mm -hmm. uh, to a few short generic headings. Yeah. He also um, seemed to think that, um, well, the, the new companion records the shift in the world of legal science from the scholarship of what he calls the doctrinal, yes. the doctrinal drudge to the mm -hmm. ologies and isms, and that academic lawyers are no longer concerned with details of private legal science but with theory. <laughs> and then, of course, the obvious shift from private law to public law and yes. um, so yes. I wanted to tell you whether you... Okay, well I probably, yeah. I mean I plead guilty to all that, yeah. but then no. <laughs> <laughs> all, all to the good I'd say. Um, the new Oxford, it's, it's a, it was a tricky, in one sense it's a very tricky thing, the, the first Oxford Companion to Law was written by one person, um, absolutely monumental uh, uh, project, highly impressive, but because it was written by one person it did reflect very much that person's interests and preoccupations and intellectual style. And when we came to doing the New Oxen Companion, we simply made a decision that we would not attempt, that it was not going to be a second edition of Walker's Oxford Companion, uh, that we needed something that was different and new. Uh, and yes, the uh, intellectual styles had changed. Uh, I'm not a doctrinal scholar in the way that Walker was a doctrinal scholar. Uh, we were trying to produce a book that would have wide international appeal. Books like this really only are financially worthwhile if they sell, have, potentially have a sale outside the UK, particularly in the US. Although there is an equivalent volume in the US, there's a, a, a companion to US law. But nevertheless, uh, we, we wanted to make it an international, a very international volume. So yes, there is much less Scots law in it. It is much more uh, theme-based. We deliberately made the choice not to put too much detail into it, partly because detail tends to go out of date very quickly, and also partly because we conceived our audience differently, I think, because we were we conceived the audience as being very broad. We, I certainly conceived this, of this as being a contribution to public legal literacy, uh, which I think was not the, probably the frame of mind in which Walker was approaching. So yes, it was. it is just a completely different book with a, uh, with a completely different ethos, a completely different purpose, a completely different approach. And people simply have to judge whether they, whether they think that's a good thing or a bad thing. I happen to think it's a good thing. But it was the, the difference is summed up in the fact that whereas Walker wrote the whole of the original, the new one, which is slightly bigger, but not very, I think his was about a million words, and I think ours is about 1.2 million words. But we had over 700 authors. So you can see that it's completely and totally. And we had, we had 40 people involved in constructing the headwords for the book. So, it, it, yes, it First, is a completely, fascinating. completely different book. Yes. Mm. The other book that I looked at, which I thought was extremely interesting, was your empirical legal research. Yes. And as, as far as I'm aware, the faculty is not heavily engaged in this kind of activity mm. here. No. D did you touch on this while in your teaching while you were here? No. I, you're quite right, and most, most law faculties don't. Uh, don't, are not much involved, and most legal academics are not much involved in empirical legal research. And I'm not involved in empirical, in empirical legal research. I'm a consumer of empirical legal research, but I've always been an avid consumer, and I think it's an extremely important uh, type, form of legal research. But uh, I, I had felt for a long time, and this, this volume only, only happened about 20 years after I first started thinking about this, that the empirical legal research community doesn't communicate with the legal academy generally very well. It doesn't communicate the, uh, the content and the value and the importance and the significance of what it does uh, for a variety of reasons as a complex picture. Uh, so, and I'd always thought that, that I wanted to do something to try and 
try and make try and make the large body of legal academics who tend to be more legally oriented, more doctrinally oriented, despite despite the earlier review, uh, uh, or or philosophically oriented. So there are a lot of legal academics now, as that review uh, suggests, who who think about law theoretically and philosophically. Uh, empirical legal uh, legal stu- uh, researchers tend to bunch in particular places. So there are some places that do a lot of it. Texas is a place that does a lot of it, for example. So there are some there are some universities. Cornell is a very a large group of people doing empirical legal research at Cornell. So there are, in the US there are some places that do a lot of it. The Centre for Socio Legal Studies in Oxford, which was an a, a, a publicly funded uh, work um, centre that did a lot of empirical work in the 70s and 80s particularly. Uh, was the main centre for empirical work in the UK at that stage. Um, quite a lot of work in cr- empirical work in criminal law. So the, here in criminology, there's quite a lot of empirical work done, but not so much outside that area. So I, I it's just another. It's, that book is another aspect of my desire to communicate to other people things that I find interesting. Yes. <laughs> well, and in this case. With the New Oxford Companion, it was a desire to try and communicate more directly with non-lawyers, whereas in the Empirical Legal Research volume, it's a desire to communicate more directly, to give Empirical Legal Researchers an, op- an opportunity to communicate more directly with the rest of the legal academy. So that's why I did it. Well, as an aside, about well, a month ago or so, mm. Yale advertised for an Empirical Research Librarian Oh, no, and really? I thought that wow. was very interesting. Mm. Actually, I mm. brought, I made a printout, and I yes. gave it to you. Yes, that is interesting. Yes, mm. um, I can't imagine any academic library in this country advertising such a post. No, no, no that also, is interesting. Yeah. Mm. Um, and finally, a work presented at the Maccabean lecture mm-hmm. and published while you've been here at Cambridge, mm-hmm. and I chose this because it's the only publication I could. Dateline while you've been here, right. and that's your morality, law, and conflicting reasons for action. Mm. Um, were you? Did you conduct your research on heart while you were here? No, that was mainly written before I actually, before I actually came. And, and what to, what made yeah. you tackle the link between morality yeah. and law? <sighs> well, it's something that I've always been interested in um, in the book on responsibility. Is, it's got a lot. There is a lot in it about the relationship between law and morality, although not very well thought out or very well developed, because of my preoccupation in that book was responsibility, and not specifically the relationship between law and morality, although a lot of the book turns on on that. Uh, and I was invited to give this Maccabean lecture, which is um, given every second year. The British Academy has been going since. 1956, I think, was the first first Maccabean lecture. Uh, and um, so uh, it was a quite intimidating invitation because it's a pretty high-profile lecture. And, uh, so, so I was... Uh, and it had to be on jurisprudence, uh, so I decided I'd try and go back and think more systematically about the relationship between law and morality. Why I did it through heart was... Because in a way I was sort of feeling my way, I think. But he's he's been an extremely influential legal theorist, the most influential English-speaking legal theorist of the 20th century. Uh, and this was one of his major preoccupations, as indeed it's the major preoccupation of many legal theorists. So I decided I'd jump in at the deep end, as it were, and have a go at trying to say what I thought about the relationship between law and morality more systematically, and although I hadn't thought about it systematically before, actually I, doing it through the lens of heart was quite helpful from my point of view because I, at the end of it I got to where I wanted to be. <laughs> but I didn't really know when I started out that I'd be able to do that. So, yes, it was a long, it was a long hard process. Interesting. Well, um, all I can do is thank you so much Pleasure. for Pleasure. kindly coming and providing such an interesting and fascinating account which is going to be an extremely valuable 
addition to the archive. I'm very grateful to you. Thank you so much. 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 Th